Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Bambi Haggins, author of the award-winning book, Laughing Mad, The Black Comic Persona in Post-Soul America. As you just saw, Professor Haggins was a historical consultant on this documentary and also appears in it. So to begin, tell us about your role in this project. How did you get involved? Uh, were you approached by HBO or Whoopi Goldberg? There's a lot of questions here, but you can pick which one you like. <laughs> um, um, or someone or someone else entirely. I think many of the academics in the world, in the audience would like to know how they can get this gig. Um, you were both an on-screen presence and a behind-the-scenes consultant. So d how did you shape the project? How did you get involved? Over to you. Um, well, it was really crazy. I got on my answering machine, or voicemail rather, uh, there was a a message from Tom Leonardis, who's the president of Whoopi Incorporated, and he wanted to, to talk to me about, uh, my name had come up, and he wanted to talk to me about being in this documentary on Whoopi, uh, on Moms Mabley. And like, I came really close not to calling him back, because I just thought it was one of my friends screwing with me. Um, but I did call him back, and, uh, and he said, well, we're, gonna, we're having a lot of people come in in the next couple of weeks. We have a place over in, um, it was over in Hollywood where uh, we did in, in this hotel, I can't remember the name of the hotel, but it was like Chateau Mormont, you know, one of those super hip places that I could never afford to be on an academic, scholar, uh, academic salary. And, um, and I came in, and uh, and we just talked, um, and it was so easy, um, and so fun, and and you folks got to see one of my proudest moments, making Whoopi Goldberg laugh out loud, <laughs> um, and it, and so in terms of the um, the historical part um, being. Um, a historical consultant, it was there um, at after we had done the talk that they said, well, we need um, someone to do some work on sort of the Chitlin circuit and some things about mom's earlier life. And, and, and I, I said, sure, of course. And uh, so I, I still actually don't know who talked to him about me, because he couldn't remember. Do you think it was your book? No, I don't think they had read the book. Oh, no, or her, yeah. You okay. know, I, I, I don't think they, mm. I don't think, I did give Whoopi a copy of it, mm. uh, and she, she's never gotten back to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it was just really fortuitous, and, and it was a, a wonderful experience. Um, well, let me just move right on to just a follow-up on the historical part. That Mom's Mabley's career from the Chitlin Circuit to Carnegie Hall, as we just saw, could be said to span three main phases. The early years in the 20s and 30s, against the backdrop of the Harlem Renaissance that we see here. Um, the middle phase in the 40s and 50s, as she toured much of the East Coast and starred in ensemble race films that we don't see much of in the documentary. And the final phase in the 60s and 70s with the changing demands of the civil rights movement and white-owned liberal media and television. So could you tell us more about the ways in which moms circumvented barriers to women and African, African Americans alike in a highly segregated entertainment venue or venues? Well, I, in many ways, in the first and second phases, well, the first phase really, when we're talking about the 20s and the 30s, that's when she's doing the work on the Chitlin circuit. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't until Butterbeans and Susie brought her to, um, well, actually brought her to New York that she uh, set up a quasi residency at um, the Apollo Theater. And, and she, if mom was wanted to play the Apollo, moms played the Apollo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you, you have this period, because the Apollo is interesting in a couple of ways, because not only as of 33, they mentioned that it had been a burlesque house before, and then Mayor LaGuardia wanted to close all the, uh, all the mm -hmm. 
burlesque houses, so the Apollo went dark for a few years. It was bought by brothers who wanted to do um, colored reviews. And by 1933, it was for the, uh, for the black community, but it, it also had mixed audiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, uh, Jerry Stiller mm -hmm. mentions going, um, Dick Cavett mentions right. going. Um, so uh, in some ways, the, the, uh, the, the Apollo was this landmark place because of the fact that you had these multiple constituencies in one space. Um, and, and really, there weren't other places for um, a lot of other than on the circuit. Mm -hmm. There really weren't other places for, for black folks to perform. Um, and, and so with, with moms, um, I, I think her middle period in, in the 30s and the 40s is, uh, in the 30s, definitely, um, it is about thriving in, um, in, in Harlem um, and doing the race films towards the end. Um, there were three. Mm -hmm. And she was also in a film, her first film was with Paul Robeson in Emperor Jones, in where she just plays a, a she doesn't even have a name in it, um, but uh, I, I, I guess what I find so interesting is that in many ways you can watch that early stuff from Killer Diller and the stuff she's doing on, um, on the Smothers Brothers, and her act hasn't changed. Mm. You know, she's as blue as she was in the beginning. She is talking directly about things going on at that moment. You know, in, in, in Killer Diller and earlier in Boarding House Blues, she's talking about, you know, her man sort of living off of her, mm -hmm. and that would have been late depression era. So it perfectly makes sense that she's always been in conversation with the era and has always been talking about sort of the position that women in general and women of color particularly are put in in this society. Um, and, and so when I, when I think about how did she circumvent it, I think the world caught up with moms, not she made a way in a world. I mean, it, it was really, um, I mean, the fact that we were listening to the, you know, just watching people watch it, because after I've seen a comedy thing a few times, I love watching other people watch it. And, and you hear these wonderful laughs at this material. I showed it to, I teach a class called Comedy and, and Social Discourse. And, um, and I played that documentary for my students. And that was their favorite. They loved her. And one of the reasons is mom's blue material stays contemporary. And, and the fact that she, she is so offhanded about the stuff with Jack and Jackie and LBJ, and, and it it's, it's naturalizes this celebrity through a persona that's very carefully crafted to put you off balance. Um, because when mom went off stage, she put the teeth back in and she, um, as, as Whoopi Goldberg stated, and, you know, off went the mis mismatch stuff and on went the silk shirts and the, and the suits. And, and so there was very much a bifurcated um, identity. And I, I think that, that I really respect the fact that she stayed as close to who she was on stage for, from 1928 until 1975. And that's hard to do, because you can just look at, at the, the gymnastics that some comics use to remake their brand. Um, she was moms, and uh, and that's what made her and makes her great. Well, the documentary is really impressive in highlighting the importance of Moms Mabley.
for so many African American artists, actors, and performers. Um, and as Whoopi Goldberg remarked, she said, quote, Moms was the first, and without her, there would probably not have been a Joan, a Kathy, a Wanda, or any of the others who may follow. Without moms, there certainly wouldn't have been a Whoopi, end quote. So could you tell, say more about uh, Moms Mabley's importance, for, especially for stand-up comedians, which is um, a tough road? Yeah, it, I mean, I do believe stand-up comedy is, is just a terrifying and wonderful thing. Because it's just you and the mic. There, there, there isn't any padding. There aren't angles and lights necessarily that are going to save you if you don't actually have the chops to put out an act that is, is solid. And her act repeatedly is solid and relates to the audience that she is, is speaking to. I mean, the live at Sing Sing stuff, Mm -hmm. is just brilliant. And I remember, I, I remember listening to that album when I, w uh, when I was doing some work on this uh, and, and just thinking how hilarious it was that she really was telling the warden, you need to leave. <laughs> and, and, and in a way that may all, everybody in the audience got it. And hopefully the warden did too, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it, it's one of those instances where she embraced the audience, but she didn't, even though she was calling them her children, she didn't infantilize them. And in terms of talking about um, black culture or um, what she had been through, that comes in different ways into her act, um, there's not a lot of translation. She is not saying, well, this means da da da. She is expecting the audience to follow along. And the audience follows along because they trust her to take them on this journey. And they trust her to take her on this journey because of the fact that in some ways she's outfitting, she's outfitted in a way that, you know, downplays her sexuality, that downplays um, power in some ways. But she is absolutely in control. And she is incredibly powerful on that stage. And, and so it, it, it's, you know, like Arsenio Hall said, it's the okie doke. You know, I'm going to pull you in, pull you in, pull you in, and then boom, I'm going to tell you something real. And, uh, and that's what makes her amazing. I, I, I wrote a piece, I, I actually, um, Patricia had mentioned this before uh, when we were talking. I wrote a piece about Wanda and um, Wanda Sykes and Whoop. Whoopi Gold and uh, Moms Mabley um, for this anthology called Hysterical Women in Comedy. A and one of the things that I was thinking about um, and rethought in, in, in writing this was that I, in initially writing about, writing about moms, I don't think I gave her all the credit she deserved. Um, because the book came out in 2007, this was 2013, so I learned something in between then and now um, about what it took to actually craft an act that looks so natural. You know, it looks so easy, and that's, and it's all written. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all set up to build in a very specific way. And, um, and even with the, the performance on Playboy After Dark, uh, uh, the, doing Abraham, Martin, and John, you know, that's just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I'm glad we had to go get mic'd up before, for this so I didn't see that because it always makes me cry. Um, and it, it, because it, it, it's just a really powerful moment as one who has lived from mm -hmm. Jim Crow through the civil rights era. And, uh, and so I, I guess I think 
because of the way she does it, there's a, there's a core of honesty, even within this persona. There's a core of honesty, of, of um, genuine emotional resonance mm -hmm. that I think allows for her to pull in an audience in a different way. And everybody has different lines in terms of, of how much real stuff they're willing to give out in, um, in their act. I mean, Joan Rivers uh, went on stage after her husband is, had committed suicide and, um, and made a joke about how she, um, she wanted to make sure to visit her husband every day, so she sprinkled his ashes at Bloomingdale's. This is like not even a week after his funeral. Wanda Sykes talking about her experience of coming out to her parents and their reaction to it. You know, it, it's about how honest and how real you can be with the comedy. And, and I, think, I, I think I see some women doing some some really interesting things uh, in terms of, of really foregrounding their experiences. One of my favorites, Maria Bamford, uh, talks uh, in her act about uh, dealing with mental illness uh, and, and does it in a way that's it incredibly, you know, it, it is very funny. And one of my favorite lines of hers is, I'm not so much depressed as paralyzed by hope. You know, it, it, so there are all of these ways that I think there are people who are actually conveying something that they feel is really important and has not necessarily been dealt with in, in, a, ve in a very direct way. Um, and I, I think whenever you are opening, up, opening yourself up to your audience in a significant way, um, that is both scary and also, particularly for women who are already accused of not being funny, um, when you get that honest on, on stage, it can, uh, you know, it can definitely, um, it's a tightrope. Mm -hmm. And some people, it, it, and, and it's a really hard thing to balance. I think it's hard to balance for any comic, but I think because it's so much harder for a woman and a woman of color, to you know, rise that quickly, um, I, I think that that it, it's. I think that it's important that someone like Moms, in a time that was so difficult, was you know really saying, "I'm gonna be me, I'm gonna be who I am," mm -hmm. and as much as she could. Mm -hmm. So, did that answer your question? Yes. Excellent. I want to just return to your book a little bit um, because there you show how black comics have become progressively more important to mainstream culture. And yet you make the convincing argument that the potential of African American comedy remains fundamentally unfulfilled um, as the performance of blackness continues to be made culturally digestible for mass c consumption. So in this regard, could you talk a little bit about the notion of a crossover narrative and the ways in which the term only gets applied to non-white performers. This is a, a, a major argument in your book. Yeah, and the, it was written before Get Out and Black Panther. Exactly. Um, it, it, and because I think in, in some ways, there are things about both of those films that were runaway hits that refuse to translate. Mm -hmm. That re, I mean, a lot of crossover in the past has been about providing some kind of translation, um, be, being able to make people comfortable with the ways that I'm pushing you. And, and, and in class the other day, I was telling, I was saying this to students, it's like com the best comedy is edgy, but how they decide to be edgy it, it, you know, is it a sharp edge or is it a soft edge? Because sometimes a soft edge will ease people into thinking about 
um, more complicated issues. But a sharp edge is just saying, mm -hmm. this is what it is, and you need to look at it. I mean, one of my favorite comics who you had here a couple of weeks ago, Hari, Hari Kondabalu, is pretty upfront, you know, about anti-racism, anti-sexism, um, and, and, you know, combating transphobia and xenophobia, and it's right out there. But that's not an easy pill for everybody to swallow. And I think, um, you know, one of his jokes is that, you know, this is why I'm still on NPR and not on network television. Um, and, and I think that, that sometimes it becomes easier not to push an audience and just to endear yourself to an audience. And, and so, um, but then there are people like, uh, you know, and, and that cuts both ways. Like, I love Dave Chappelle. I think he is one of the most brilliant comics ever. Am I angry that he did a transphobic joke in the f first round and then doubled down in his second se set of specials? Absolutely. But he did that because he's Dave Chappelle. I, I, and I'm not rationalizing it. I'm just saying that what we respect or what we are attracted to in him is he says whatever he's going to say. Mm -hmm. And you can like it or not like it. But it, that's, it, that's basically the way it goes. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to say, no, I thought that was wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I, it, it comes to that very tough place about the art and the artist and, and where, we fall, where we fall on that. How do you separate the things? I mean, this is the first time I've watched it since all the Cosby hoo-ha, and um, it feels a little weird seeing him say naughty, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's just... It's no. crazy. It did not make you feel weird. Yeah, that's not <laughs> You're on it. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it's, um, but, but I do think that, that, I think that comedy has to push buttons. Mm -hmm. I think it, it has to, there have to be people who are willing to be the Lenny Bruce or the Dick Gregory or the Moms Mabley or, you know, the Hari. Yeah, you know, the W. Kamau Bell, people who are, are pushing it, and of course the prior, um, who are pushing expectations. Um, but it, it's, uh, but it's, a, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Well, speaking of double edges and multiple edges, I want to just turn to a question about uh, mom's sexuality mm -hmm. um, and performance of her sexuality. Um, when bragging and lying about her relationships with young male celebrities like contemporary nightclub singer Cab Calloway, um, she used overt heterosexuality as a cover, although, as you've written, those in the know saw it as a wink towards her own fluid sexuality. Um, her, ol her old band jokes, which we heard many of tonight, um, could, could be seen as a response to her experiences with forced marriage and sexual assault. Um, Yet despite the fact uh, that the, so the norms of her lifetime prevented her from directly addressing her identity as well as her life experience, it just wouldn't have been, as I said, you know, what were you saying? We just, there's none of your business. We're yeah. not gonna talk to you about it. Her humor was deftly political. Um, can you say more about how she accomplished this and why stand-up is such an important venue for it? Well, I, I think that I think the fact that it was it basically in Harlem too, mm -hmm. uh, during that time, uh, during the during the Harlem Renaissance and in the years that still had the vestiges of the Harlem Renaissance uh, in, in New York at that period of time, there was it it, it was nobody's business. There was more uh, more fluidity in terms of performance of gender uh, than there had been before. Um, I think that that was harder for her to do outside of New York. 
um, or outside of, of a more continental hub. Um, and, and, but I think what Moms was articulating about young men, young men, she was doing with young women right. the whole time. So it, it, we just had to. We know that the age is a matter. The age was mm -hmm. the age was the deal, and in terms of of you know the old man jokes, it again it's really about control of your own body and control of your sexuality. Because she, if you're stuck with an old man, that that really pins you in, in terms of what you can what you can do, um, especially when it's an enforced marriage or an enforced betrothal, um, and and even how she got her name, um, she it was from a boyfriend, um, uh, Jack Mabley, hmm. and. And so she goes by Jackie, Mom's Mabley. And she said, he took everything from me. The least I can do is take his name. <laughs> you know, it, so it, 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 I think that there is a, a way in which a lot of things she did were about feeling empowered and feeling protected mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, and of course, I, I mean, there was no way in 1967 or, or even 1975 for her to come out uh, completely. And she also became very more religious as she got older. And she had, had children as well from, from male partners. Um, so um, there, there, there's, still, uh, a, a, there's still controversy about that in terms of her story. But as Whoopi mentioned, because of when mom's story happens, between the, you know, she's born in 1897, maybe, <laughs> and to 1975, there's a lot of our history that, that doesn't, didn't make it right. into archives, that didn't even get written down. So uh, I, I think that what we put together, um, or what was put together here, was give a sense of how moms became moms and what impact that had on um, on other comics and on comedy. And, and so, uh, I guess I I just I feel so grateful to have been put in a position to really have to look to really understand how much she did. And because she is, she is forgotten by so many. But a lot of women comics are forgotten. Phyllis Diller is forgotten. How could anybody forget Phyllis Diller? But, but she is, you know? She was one of the best joke writers, mm -hmm. just pure joke writers ever. And she didn't start being a stand-up until she was 39. That's like unheard of. But it, it, there are stories that get told, and there are stories that don't get told. And, um, and I think because of, of race, because of gender, because of sexual orientation on some level, uh, I think there are ways that, that she hasn't really, moms hasn't really been written into history the way she should have been. And that's why Whoopi made the movie. Mm -hmm. And that's why we thought it was so important to have you come and talk about it and show this movie in, in a series on women in comedy. Um, I wanted to just turn a little bit to the question about you know crossover narratives that are accepted by mainstream. Um, as you just said, she maybe had a distinct con comic persona that was stayed fairly uh, stable, and she developed it on the Chitlin circuit in the 20s, honed it during her headlining days at the Apollo in the 30s and 40s, and maintained it throughout. Um, even the performances at Sing Sing, um, the Playboy Club, which is like so incredible. I, you know, I, I'm sure I watched it at the time. Um, um, and the Smothers Brothers, which I did watch at the time, had, and Ed Sullivan. But given that she didn't fit the respectability mold often, re often required of black performers, 
Her humor, appearance, behavior, both on and off stage, didn't adhere to either black middle class um, and gender respectability politics. Um, how did the construction of her persona and the context of her um, act carve out a unique place for her, especially, I mean, even in relationship to black audiences? I mean, we, were he we hear in the documentary just the fact of seeing her, hearing her, and, you know, Whoopi saying we're watching and, you know, but it's, you know, we don't have to say it's just this is ours. Well, I think moms was grandfathered in in terms of her persona. Mm -hmm. um, I, when, you know, Moms was known in the black community from 1928 all the way through when we first see her on television in 1967. Um, even when she, she uh, plays the Playboy Club right after Dick Gregory broke the color barrier there and then went on, uh, on to you know, play Carnegie Hall. Um, and I think that there was a certain acceptance of who she was. She was moms before, before the civil rights movement began. Um, and because she was integrating that into her act, what she was saying was a message they could they could stand for, and, and it, even the most you know respectable of respectability politics people, and and, and you know it, 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 if even like with the exception of of Cosby, when you think about Dick Gregory, when you think about even Richard Pryor, all of them got sucked up into that respectability. You know, we have to wear the suit and we have to have the, you know, nice, even haircut and we have to look a certain way. And, and, and very, very pointedly, um, Richard Pryor said, it wasn't until I killed the Cosby in my act that I was able to actually find my voice. Because that was a lot easier for people to take. You know, that was, and, and Dick Gregory got to the point where he was an activist who did comedy on the side <laughs> because he could no longer book gigs because he didn't know if he was going to be in jail because of a civil rights protest. Um, it, so it, it, it's, um, I think Moms was able to sort of straddle her old school presentation and, um, and dealing with civil rights. Because there is a lot of vaudevillian mm -hmm. in moms. I mean, if, if, when they show her as, a, as quite young, um, saying, I, but I suppose you're looking for moms to tell you some jokes. Well, I don't know no jokes, but I can tell you some facts. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a way in which she is very attached to that world but she also, the content of her humor does change and does become bolder and bolder. In terms of sexuality, it, it was always bold, but um, it becomes more and more bold in terms of, of talking about racism. I mean, the, the thing on the Merv Griffin show, I love that, about the trigger bit. Yeah. That's just brilliant. Um, and, and, I, I, and you could just see Merv Griffin's discomfort, which made me so happy. Um, <laughs> but but it, it's just one of those things where, where she grew, in terms of content of her comedy, grew with the times um, in terms of interacting with civil rights, um, in terms of the content of, of women's sexual agency, that was always there. Right. And that was, and, and I think talking about sexuality in general was always more present in, in black comedy than it was in mainstream uh, white comedy in the 50s and the 60s. That's why when, you know, Mort Saul and, and Shelley Berman and Nichols and May and all of those people emerge in the early 60s, they refer, and Mort Saul, of course, they refer to as the sick comics because they're talking about, it's not 
take my wife, please. Yeah. It's um, telling stories and, it, and, and it's commenting on society and relationships in a different way than it had before. Um, but I think what's different about moms that in a way that Pigmeat Markham couldn't do it, in a way that other comics of the era couldn't really cross over um, because mom had a foot, it, it was kind of riding the old school and new school at the same time. Um, she was able to find an entree into, um, you know, into mainstream comedy. And, and even like with, with Red Fox, who everybody knows about, um, you know, Red Fox, uh, he was so blue. Um, and blue referring to, um, basically referring to this as the off color material, um, usually sexually explicit. Um, but Red Fox, when he actually had got the show uh, Sanford and Son, all of these people who are working on it from Grady to on Esther to are all old comics, mm -hmm. all old comics who were part of his class, you know, who were part, who were people who were playing at the Red Fox Club, who are people who were, had done that kind of material. It, it's sort of pre-Dolomite kind of uh, 70s risque material. Um, but. I ventured way off the track. Oh, I'm this sorry. Is, uh, well, just to, I want to just circle back to her popularity and her crossover popularity um, and what we hear from Arsenio Hall listening to the, the LPs um, that were kind of naughty. Um, but she was, her first comedy albums were released in 1961, and she continued to release a substantial series across the decade. Most of these were produced by Chess and Mercury record companies, two Chicago-based companies, mostly specializing in blues and jazz. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the emergence of the comedy record and mom's role in, in that process of the? Well, there, there actually were comedy records before that. Um, the Blue List, uh, 1948, Red Fox, No Label. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, was produced. Um, I mean, it, it, so there were records that were circulated through Chess and Mercury. That this was really an opportunity for black comics mm -hmm. to to find a space. It is. Um, I guess we're talking about because Nichols and May's first album was in like sixty two, mm -hmm. sixty two or sixty three. Um, and then you have um, like Bob Newhart, and uh, it, so it, it, and by the mid '60s you have Cosby, um, who's not on either Mercury or mm. or um, Chess. Chess, it, but is on a uh, one of the mainstream labels that had the other folks on, on it. Um, Columbia, I think. Mm. Um, so I, I think that that. It, it, you know, in the same way that chess, particularly chess, had created a space for black artists to actually have their work recorded and played and seen um, and heard, rather. I, I think that the, there were those venues. But actually, mom jumps to capital mm. towards the end um, of the 60s? Yeah, towards the end of the 60s. Um, because, again, she's going to get a better deal. And, and her, her records, and she put out a lot of records between 61 and, and I think her last one was in, uh, it was after, after Bobby was killed, so 69. Mm -hmm. 69 or early 70. So, um, it, it, it's a, uh, and there are lots of, you know, there are other people who, who you don't necessarily know of today who, who had, you know, a, a sizable career via records like Godfrey Cambridge, or we, who we saw, yes, yes. And, and Dick Gregory had a million albums. And, 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 and the, so, and then, you, I mean, and there were definitely, you know, the more risque albums, you know, 
there were Pig Meat Markham and, and Mom's uh, albums, which I, I have. Um, it's hard to listen to them because they're really old. Um, but, but it, it you know, it, it's just a... It, What's hard I, to listen to? The physical record, because it's so screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, there, there used to be this great little place in Michigan that was about the size of the green room mm. that was packed with records, ceiling to floor. And it was called Al's or something like that. And the old guy would smoke cigarettes in the corner and you'd ask about something and there looked like there was no organization at all. And he'd go, oh, that stack. And it'd be right there, but like literally this tiny space that was back in the old days of looking for records before it became impossible to find anything anymore. Well, how would this documentary be different if it were made today uh, and you were the consultant? Uh, what voices would be included that aren't included? I'd actually have Wanda, mm -hmm. um, for sure. Um, You know, there are some people I would feel I would be curious about putting in, like uh, Kevin Hart or um, Tiffany Haddish, mm -hmm. who is the hottest thing on the block right now. Um, just to see how their, uh, what their reactions or their connections, because they're two generations right. removed from it right. now. Whereas, you know, Clearly, with Eddie and Arsenio, there's a more direct connection, and and even I would argue if you had Chris Rock in there or something, right. someone like that, or even Chappelle, right. there'd be more of a connection. Um, but and actually, in Bring the Pain, a Chris a Chris Rock's first special, he had flashes all these album covers mm -hmm. of people, and Moms is one of the album covers that mm -hmm. flash by. Um, do I think the content would be significantly different? No. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's her, it's about as much of her story as can be told. Right. And there are holes in it. Right. You know, there, there are things that, that we don't know. Right. Um, but, but I think that, that what made it meaningful to me was seeing the genuine connection that everybody who was interviewed had with her as a, as a person, as an artist, as a symbol. And, and if, if, if I, I don't know if, if people three generations removed understand or, or see why she's significant. And that's another reason this yeah. documentary is both well, good and necessary. Well, let me ask a final question before we open up for um, audience uh, questions. Um, since women have been historically dissociated from humor in general, it should come as no surprise that the historiography of black humor in the United States has excluded them as well. So can you tell us more about the importance of remembering Moms Mabley today? You've kind of said that there's a generation, especially of African-American comedians who are, some who may be aware, some who may not be aware, all are indebted to this, but I wonder if you just had a final word before we answer questions the audience might have. I, I think that, that, it's, um, that it's important that the best comics are actually students of comedy. Yes. They know who has done what, they, they are influenced by a variety, uh, a, a variety of qualities. Um, and part of that, and, and it, it makes me feel so old to say that, but you know, it, part of it is like, you've got to know your history. You've got to know the past in order, in order to, to improve upon it or to avoid some of the same pitfalls. And, and I think we, it, comedy definitely goes through swings. Um, I, I think right now there is, um, 
there are ways in which I think there is a greater understanding and sensitivity to cultural difference. Um, but it'll swing back. And, and I the, thought we already had swung back. Uh, well, but comedy, but as we know, in, in periods like this, the art that's created is often really amazing. Yeah. Because it, it happens in response. In response and in confronting mm -hmm. the actual, you know, one's actual existence. Um, but but I, I, I think, if, I, I mean, I think like the bro humor of the early aughts has really sort of faded. Um, and what I mean by bro humor is uh, Dane Cook. If you know who Dane Cook is, that's the archetypal bro hum humor, the bro next door. Um, who, uh, yeah, and there, and and I think that that there's also, um, I think there are also some interesting things going on with women in comedy in general, uh, just playing different kinds of roles. Um, that you have, I mean, for a while it was like there was Tina Fey, you know, who is awesome in her own way, although flawed on issues of race. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but, you know, I think that there are, you know, there are Elena Glazer and, and um, Abby Jacobson with A Broad City that's produced by Amy Poehler. Uh, you have Issa Rae finally getting a vehicle on HBO with Insecure. Right. Um, I would say Lena Waithe, but it's not, it, it, the chai isn't really no, it's not comedy. comedy. Um, but, you know, child, oh, I, I was about to call Donald Glover Childish Gambino, which he is, but um, a Donald Glover with, with Atlanta. And of course, um, you have Kenya Barris with, with Blackish. Mm -hmm. And so you have these spaces where the comedy that is, is coming out and is being voiced um, give more of a space for funny women or funny, you know, funny folks who are from marginalized groups to find spaces where they can actually express their life experiences as well as their humor. Let's thank Bambi Packins for joining us and being part of this. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everyone.